Hey everyone, this is Nick and welcome to your weekly Linux and open source news video. This time around we have a major vulnerability in the Linux kernel version 5.8 and upwards. We have the framework laptop having total just works support for most Linux distributions. And we have Stadia maybe looking at running Windows games, but not through Proton. Let's begin right after I tell you how you can protect your privacy with today's sponsor, Startpage Privacy Protection. Thanks to Startpage for sponsoring this video. You might already have heard about Startpage as a search engine that uses Google results, but anonymizing them and removing every single point of data that Google could use to track you and your searches. But now they've launched a new extension called Startpage Privacy Protection. It's an extension for Chrome and Firefox, but you can also install it on any Chromium-based browser. What it does is simple. It will set your default search engine to Startpage, but you can still change that back if you prefer another private search engine. It will send do not track signals to all websites you visit. It will block any third party tracking script and it will replace all social media, video and music site tracking with click to activate controls. On top of that, it will display a privacy rating for each site based on its behavior before everything was blocked. And it will also give you a complete privacy report to let you know what you blocked all throughout your browsing session. Oh, and if you're afraid that it's going to break some websites that you visit, you can tell the extension to let some cookies or some tracker scripts pass through the extension just so the website can work. If you want to try out that new extension, just follow the link in the description below. If I tell you dirty pipe, what do you think of? A male porn star? A DJ? No, it's a major Linux vulnerability resulting from a bug in the Linux kernel. It lets anyone with an account, even without any privileges, to add an SSH key to the root's user account, which means that anybody could use that SSH key to access a server remotely using SSH. It can also let malicious actors create a root shell or override data in read-only files. Basically, it's really severe and it also affects Android. It's been introduced in the Linux kernel 5.8, which isn't on many production servers, but it's still pretty darn bad. Of course, there's already a fix, but it won't help people who already have been infected by that vulnerability. If you have any servers, might be worth taking a look at what you're running, just in case. NVIDIA hackers are at it again. These crazy kids seem to have used stolen certificates to add malware to driver downloads on Windows for NVIDIA drivers. They also had a very peculiar demand. Release all driver code as open source or get forcefully open sourced as the whole terabyte of stolen data would be leaked. Well, now they also want NVIDIA to remove the limitations they put on their GPUs on crypto mining, especially for Ethereum. Obviously, both demands are ridiculous because if NVIDIA doesn't comply, then their code is out there and anyone can disable that limitation on crypto mining or access the source to their drivers. So it's either do what we say or we do it anyways. There's no winning. Not counting the fact that leaking that source code would actually hurt open source projects that are using NVIDIA stuff because that leaked code would be legal kryptonite. You cannot prove that you haven't taken a look at it to develop your own stuff and that equals to huge lawsuit risks. Stadia, Google's cloud gaming service, seemed on its way to the massive Google project's graveyard as user numbers seemed low, internal development had been stopped and Google generally doesn't seem to give a crap about the service. Well, they still have one last hurrah, apparently, because it seems that they might be working on a Windows emulator to run Windows titled as is on Stadia, which could boost its catalog a lot. A senior software engineer at Google will host a talk at the Google for Games Developer Summit titled How to Write a Windows Emulator for Linux from Scratch. Their tool isn't based on Proton, apparently, and the engineer in question works for Stadia in Canada. We'll have to see what that implies for the service and if this move can salvage it from what looked like certain death. The Google graveyard cares not about petty emulators. It wants more projects so that Google Reader feels less alone. Yeah, I'm still pissed about Google Reader. KDE has a new project and it seems very interesting for laptop users. It's called KDE Echo and it aims to reduce KDE's power consumption, not only to give you better battery life, but also to reduce environmental impact. It looks like a team up with the FOSS Energy Efficiency Project or FEEP and KDE team members are organizing to tackle the issue, starting with collecting energy measurements for various applications via scripted usage scenarios that reproduce standard user behavior. 
Once that's done, they'll be able to start tackling the moments where software uses the most energy, and try to reduce that. It's a very cool project that I would love to see generalized to other desktop environments, because in the meantime, it probably means that KDE will take the crown of the most energy efficient desktop, at least in the future. Something I missed last time, but the Free Software Foundation has appointed a new executive director. The previous one, John Sullivan, has been replaced by Zoe Kuiman, but he will still stay for a few months to help the transition. The new director has been with the FSF since 2019 and has a background in project management and event producing like organizing the Libra Planet events. She'll now lead the FSF with responsibilities ranging from operations, licensing, recruitment or fundraising. Personally, I think it's a great thing because she looks very qualified for that job and as a woman, she might help erase or at least alleviate the controversy with Richard Stallman and the FSF. Linux Mint announced a few features that will land on Linux Mint 21, the next major version of the super popular and super green distro. Mint 21 will be based on Ubuntu 22.04 and will be supported until April 2025. It will use Cinnamon 6, the latest version of that desktop environment, which will bring its window manager more in line with GNOME's Mutter compositor. It should bring better performance and also make sure that it can benefit from upstream improvements. On top of that, the Blueberry Bluetooth config tool will be replaced by Blueman, which should help support a lot more Bluetooth devices, since it uses a newer protocol. They also publish the roadmap so people can see where things stand and they'll probably avoid too many when does it release questions. The Budgie desktop got a new update which should alleviate concerns after the departure of Joshua Strobel from Solus, which is the main user and developer for this desktop. Budgie 10.6 isn't a huge version but it brings 11 months of dev work, including a theme revamp, including more rounded corners, a rewrite of the notification system, which should now be usable by other budgie components than the Raven panel, and improvements to the task list and application tracking that should make using it more reliable with apps like LibreOffice and others that didn't provide all necessary information to be correctly displayed. It's been a long time since I used budgie. I recognize my failing and I'll make sure to correct it. Firefox 98 was released. It simplifies file downloads by automatically downloading them instead of always asking the user if they want to open or save. Right-clicking on a file will net a few options like always opening similar files, going back to the download page or showing the file in its download folder. Apart from that, you can also set a specific application to open specific file types. The download panel will also automatically open once you start a download so you know that something is actually happening. Firefox 98 also finally supports the dark mode preference, so it will switch to a dark theme correctly on Elementor iOS and GNOME 42. It also seems that Firefox will actually lose a few options for default search engines because they couldn't get formal agreements to include them in Firefox again, but they didn't mention which search engines would be removed. Remember that awesome framework laptop that can be repaired, upgraded, dismantled and also does laptop things? Well, Ubuntu just works on it, which means you can just slap the basic ISO and you won't have to do any tweaking work after install. Previously, the Wi-Fi and fingerprint reader required a bit of manual work to make them, well, work. The latest LTS updates that I mentioned last time makes all these tweaks unnecessary, which means that basically all distros should run out of the box on that fantastic piece of hardware which I wish I could get my hands on. Maybe it's time to send them another email to request a review unit. Valve continues to wear its good guy hat with a cool new announcement about the Steam Deck. They're open sourcing the SteamOS dev kit client and the SteamOS dev kit service. Both of these are now available from their GitLab page and they provide clear instructions to install them and see what that's like. These tools let developers upload builds from their development device to a Steam Deck to start testing. So they are the crucial part to make sure that games run well on that fantastic new handheld. There's no approval process and some nice tools to control the deck remotely, like switching to desktop mode or back to gaming mode. Valve is really doing a fantastic job around the Steam Deck and to ensure that developers have everything they need to make their stuff run on it. And I can't wait to see what it means for the future of Linux gaming in general. Now speaking of the Steam Deck, we now have 1,220 games marked as certified or playable, specifically 668 certified titles and 555 playable titles. They seem to add about 25 new titles per day, which isn't too bad, 
but at that rate, they'll take ages to finish that review process. Interesting titles added to the list include Apex Legend as certified, Metal Gear Solid 5, Metro Exodus, Dead Island Riptide, Need for Speed Rivals, Tales from the Borderlands, or Red Faction Guerrilla. Personally, my great on deck list on my Steam Deck only includes 23 games. With the playable games on top of that, it goes up to 66 or something, which is still way more than I'll be able to play before the next Steam sale and I buy some more. Now still on the topic of Linux gaming, we now have two new releases for DXVK and VKD3D Proton. DXVK 1.10 improves performance for Assassin's Creed Origins, Elex 2, God of War, a plethora of Resident Evil games, Total War Warhammer 3 and others. VKD3D Proton, which is DXVK's counterpart for running DirectX 12 games, saw its 2.6 release, which fixes a black screen issue in Horizon Zero Dawn, a startup crash issue for Warframe, and a hang issue in Elden Ring when closing the game. There's also reduced loading times and workarounds for games that don't do things the regular way. These updates will land in Proton pretty soon, and I'm very excited to see the performance improvements for Total War Warhammer 3, because that game has no business being that sluggish on an 8-core Ryzen 7 5800X and on a 3070. And we also have not so great news about Linux gaming support, as Bungie doubles down on refusing to bring Destiny 2 to Linux or to the Steam Deck. They had already said that there was no plan to bring the game to us, but now they're also adding literal insult to injury in a weirdly worded paragraph which says, I quote, it means choosing to not support platforms that could provide bad actors. So Linux is apparently a nest of bad people just waiting to cheat, regardless of the market share and the simple volume of players this could bring compared to the already existing player base. And also disregarding the fact that BattleEye, the anti-cheat software that Destiny 2 uses, has Linux support and Proton support. Let's wait and see, I'm sure the bad actor's excuse will vanish in a second as soon as Valve posts good numbers for the Steam Deck purchases. And finally, the Heroic Games launcher is getting closer to a full-on flat hub release, which also means that it's getting closer to a full-on being available on the Steam Deck. And on that topic, stay tuned because in about two days I'll have a video about that. As of now, it's still available as an app image, in a PPA, in the AUR and other various places, but Flatpak and Flathub wasn't an option. With the release of the Steam Deck, it looks like it's changing, and Flatpak is indeed becoming a priority. They've been getting help from the developer of the Bottles app that lets you manage your Windows software installed through Wine in a more legible manner. There's also a new update version 2.2.2, which fixes the new GOG implementation and prepares that transition to Flatpak. And that's about it for this video, which was brought to you by Slimbook. These guys operate in Valencia, Spain, and they make Linux desktops and laptops, like for example the Slimbook Essential. This is their entry-level Ultrabook. It's small, it's lightweight, it's not expensive at all, it's well-built, it's got a great keyboard, it's got a great display, it's got good internals. Basically, it's great value for the money, and a lot of people keep asking me where are the cheap Linux laptops? Well, they're in the link in the description below. If you want to grab a Slimbook Essential, just click that link, look it up, it's a really great device. I also have a review on the channel, you can search for that if you want as well. Now, thanks everyone for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't stay to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to drop a comment. And if you want to help support the channel, you can join my Patreon subscribers or my YouTube members. Both get access to a weekly Patreon cast in which I discuss Linux, the news, my personal stuff, the channel and ideas that I have. And you'll also get the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover each month. So thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!